Now moving on to the third assumption, the historical cost assumption, and this is a big one. This one's pretty important. And it basically assumes that assets purchased are recorded at the amount that was paid for them. So whether that's for cash or non-cash considerations or a mix of both. So for example, let's say that uh, you buy a laptop for your business. And let's say that you give someone $1,000 cash for it plus your iPhone. Let's say that the iPhone is valued at $400. If you were to take it to the market, sell it, it would be around $400. So then this laptop you would value on your books at $1,400 for the cash plus the non-cash consideration that was given for it. Right, let's do a bigger example. Let's say that uh, you have a company and um, you're gonna buy some real estate let's say to uh, put your office in. Let's say you buy this real estate for $200,000 for 200K. And let's say two years goes by. And let's say that based on real estate in your area that's been bought and sold recently, let's say within the last month or two months, based on those transactions, on the square footage, et cetera, et cetera, this real estate that you have is now worth 250. Okay, that if you were to take it to the market, you could probably sell it for 250K. What do you value the real estate at on your books, on your financial statements? Well, according to the historical cost assumption, assets purchased are recorded at the amount that was paid for them. So at the time of purchase, it was 200K. So that's what you continue to value it at. Now, why? Well, Number one, we don't know how reliable these comparables are. Maybe we're looking at real estate that even though it's within the same area, maybe it's a different kind of real estate. Maybe there's a bit of a bubble in the market and there's maybe some artificial demand going on, right? We don't know how verifiable this is. This is verifiable. This is reliable here because this transaction actually happened for that specific piece of real estate. Even though it was two years ago in the past, it still happened we could still verify that transaction, right? So this is more of a reliable estimate. There's not as much bias for it. Another reason is that going back to that first assumption, that going concern assumption or that continuity assumption, we're assuming that this business is going to continue to operate normally well into the future. Okay, and if they are gonna to continue to operate normally well into the future, then you're not gonna be selling this real estate. You're gonna be continuing to use that office for the business. So maybe even if it's valued at 250K and that's a legit estimate, you're not gonna be realizing that anytime soon because you're gonna to continue to use the real estate for your business, normal operations. You're gonna to continue to use that office. Now, let's say that we get pretty reliable that uh, we can sell the real estate for 250K. We get more reliable. So let's say that maybe we put up the real estate on the market and then we get a bunch of offers from really credit worthy buyers. We have the offers in front of our face for 250K and then we just back out of the deal in that last second. So we're pretty confident that we could get this 250K in the market. And let's say that there's no bubble, there's no artificial demand going on, that's the legit price of this real estate. Why not value it at what it is? <clears throat> well, in accounting, this is a pretty important concept to uh, get your head around. In accounting, external users are okay with being under-promised and then over-delivered, right? So even though maybe it's worth 250K and that's a legit estimate, external users would rather just see the 200K. They'd rather just take the conservative estimate. Right, because they're okay with being under-promised and then companies over-delivering in the future. 
And as technology gets more sophisticated, accounting may start moving towards this fair value. This here is the fair value, right? But until that happens, then this historical cost assumption is going to stay. And so we're going to continue to value it at that 200K. It's the conservative thing to do. And again, external users, investors, creditors, they're okay with being under promise and then over delivered on the financial statements. Problems arise when companies start over promising and then under delivering. Okay, so that starts being a problem. Even in your personal life, you may have ran into someone that maybe promised something Right? And then they ended up under delivering or not even delivering at all. Right? And you, we kind of lose a little bit of trust in that person, depending on how big of a deal it was. But even if it was a small deal, you kind of just subconsciously lose trust for somebody. Right? So it's always better to under promise and over deliver. And in your personal life, this, in your personal life, it's one thing, but when you're dealing with big corporations and big businesses and they start over promising on their financial statements and then under delivering, well, this can lead to jail time. The repercussions can get pretty big in the business world when this starts happening, right? Big example, I've mentioned them before, is uh, Enron. Over promised on their uh, financial statements and in the end um, ended up under delivering big time. Now here we dealt with real estate and generally real estate is going up in value usually. But what if we have an asset that goes down in value? So a popular one, we're going to be dealing with this in future chapters actually is inventory. So let's say that you buy $200,000 worth of inventory, 200k, and usually inventory for a healthy company doesn't stay within the company for too long. Usually you buy inventory and you're selling it quickly. That's the sign of a healthy company. But let's say that uh, in your business you buy 200K worth of inventory and let's say sales slow down a little bit and you end up having this inventory on hand for a little longer than you want to. And let's say that this inventory goes down in value. Let's say it goes down to 150. Okay, which amount are you going to record this inventory on your books? Well, if you follow the historical cost assumption, assets purchased are recorded at the amount that was paid for them, 200K. That's what you would record it at if you follow this assumption. But notice if we record it at 200K, what are we doing? We're over promising, but under delivering it's really worth less than we're showing it at. And so this is an example or an exception of where the historical cost assumption may not work, where it might fail us, quote unquote. And actually when this happens, we're gonna see with inventory specifically, if it does go down to 150K, we would actually incur that 50K loss and value it at that new figure of 150k. So we would take the lower of the cost, this amount, and the market, the lower of those amounts, and value it at that, right? And the lower amount is the market value, the 150k. Sometimes this would be called the net realizable <clears throat> value. But anyway, we'll get into the specifics of that in a future section when we're dealing with inventory. But just wanted to mention that that there are exceptions to the historical cost assumption and uh, those exceptions have to be dealt with. But in general, if a company is a going concern, meaning they're gonna continue to operate well into the future, we're assuming that, then in general, the assets are gonna go up in value and inventory is going to be sold, but we still gotta be on the lookout for these types of losses. And uh, actually, one thing I want to mention with the historical cost assumption, a really cool result that happens because of it is that there are investment opportunities that can happen. So let's say that you're looking at a company that bought 200K worth of real estate, but let's say they bought this real estate like 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago, a really long time ago. 
and you're confident that the real estate has gone up in value, right? You do your research and you know that the real estate is worth a lot more. But when you look at the stock price, the amount that the stock is trading at on the market, the stock price is, the value of it is closer to the real estate being valued at this amount here. And you know that it's worth a lot more. Well, you would then be pretty confident in investing in the stock of that company, buying the stock of that company. And the market may not value it right away, but in time the market will, should value that real estate at its proper amount and then that stock price would as a result go up and you would make a return. That's a very simple example, but <clears throat> it's why this historical assumption, the historical cost assumption provides a lot of opportunities for investments. And that's what investors are doing. They're looking for companies that are under promising and are gonna over deliver that are being conservative, and then the market is not seeing that. That's basically what um, guys like Warren Buffett, people that are value investors, that come from the philosophy of value investing, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for companies that are under-promising, but are over-delivering or are going to over-deliver in the future, and the market isn't seeing that. It's not valuing that yet. So you wanna invest in a company like that, and then, eventually you'll realize a good return. Actually, a good example of that is, um, is Amazon, which is one of the bigger companies in the world now. But for a long time, Amazon was actually looked down upon and they were slept on for a while. And I'll provide a simple example of why. Basically what was happening was, let's say they had revenue of $10, and then they had expenses of four. So what was their profit? Their profit was six. But what was happening was they weren't realizing this profit, right? They weren't taking this profit out of the company and having a ball. They were taking that $6 and they were reinvesting into the company. And when you reinvest money back into a company, that gets treated like an expense. And so really the profit that they were showing, their bottom line, was zero. And what was happening was everyone was looking at this amount over here, at this zero dollar profit, right? A lot of people weren't actually going into the financial statement and analyzing what was actually happening. Seeing that no, the actual profit was six, they were just reinvesting that six back into the company. So the final profit they were showing was zero. So they were under promising, but because they were reinvesting back into the company, back into the infrastructure, back into their systems, making things more efficient, back into their team, so their team was more productive, they were gonna over deliver in the future. And what was happening was the revenues were going up. So maybe the next year they had $12 worth of revenue. Maybe they had the same $4 expense. They had $8 worth of profit now, and then they would take that $8 and reinvest it back and then show a final profit of zero. And people kept looking at this zero right here, right? So they were under promising the whole time, but in the end, they were going to uh, over deliver. And if you were a sophistic uh, sophisticated enough investor, where you analyze the financial statements, the income statements, and analyze the company, did diligent research, and actually saw what was going on, seeing this reinvestment back into the company, you would have been pretty confident in buying their stock, and you would have realized a nice return now. Uh, you would have rode a nice wave. And notice how like Jeff Bezos, the founder, just exploded on the Forbes list and it was like a recent explosion is because everyone started to realize that this is what was happening. Like in 2017, I think he was at, his net worth was at like 80 billion, which was around like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates and those guys. And then in 2018, his net worth doubled to 160 billion. And he was so far ahead of everyone. And it's because everyone started realizing what Amazon was doing, how, it wasn't really a zero dollar profit. They were really reinvesting back into the company. What's scary he is uh, 
Bezos is still probably under promising and over delivering, probably reinvesting back in the company, but this jump may not happen again because there's just now more attention on them. And so the market is kind of seeing more what they're doing. But if, um, if you could find a company like Amazon now where they're under promising, but you're confident they're going to over deliver in the future, you analyze their financial statements, you could be pretty confident in investing in them in the long run, be confident that the market's going to value them well in the long run, and you can make a good return. And so that's a cool result that can come out of the uh, historical cost assumption. Kind of went off on a tangent there. Um, but yeah, I wish someone told me that when I was first learning accounting. Because when I was learning it, I wasn't thinking about this stuff. I wasn't thinking about how it could be used in an application to investing. I was kind of looking at it from an abstract point of view. So it was a little bit dry for me. Um, but if you think about it from an investor's point of view when you're learning this stuff, then uh, you can appreciate it a little bit more. Even if you don't plan on going into finance or accounting, you can kind of uh, appreciate this whole uh, investment opportunities um, result that can happen. It's basically like complex shopping. You're looking for a deal. Anyway, historical cost assumption, assets purchased are recorded at the amount that was paid for them, whether that's for cash, non-cash considerations, or a mix of both.